Welcome to this fabulous session. It's all going to be about reflective practice today. Um, and thank you for coming. I'm Sue Cosgrove, the National Manager of PIPA, and this is my um, favourite thing to do, is to talk about mentoring and reflective practice in particular. These are my details. So if you want to email me or call me after the event, please feel free, um, um, or anytime really. It's good to catch up with you all. I'd like to acknowledge the lands on which we all meet at the moment. Um, it's really important that we acknowledge um, the traditional land of the land in which we, which we meet today. So I'm in Yanji, Brisbane, and this is Turrbal Yuba lands. And we have, um, we respect the elders, laws, customs, and creation spirits, and acknowledge that these have always been education lands and remain so. Um, and we're very conscious that in our QUT community, we have vast amounts of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are um, helping us with education for the future and really impacting our reconciliation plans, which is fabulous to have. We're very, I think we're very spoiled to have that. Um, but I'm acknowledging that you have a lot of lands that you come from. And today, in a, when we come together in this mentoring session, we like to come together uh, and chat. So in your chat function of your uh, where we are today in this Zoom, you've got this chat function where you can put the lands that you're from or you can ask questions the whole way or you can, um, if you want to talk, you can unmute yourself. We're a small group. So if you want to talk about anything that we're talking about, please feel free to. Um, Come and go as you please. It's only an hour though, so and we won't take too too much of your time because we understand you're all busy practitioners. Uh, we've got some disclaimers, copyrights, those sorts of things there. And the big thing that we agree to today, and this is the first thing I like to see people acknowledge, is that when we come today um, and how we turn up today and presence for this session is all about. Otto Sharma's two cycles of presidency and we're going to be open with an open mind and open heart and an open will. So that means anything we talk today about is because we're curious, we're compassionate and we've got a lot of courage to talk. So everything that we talk about today is sacred in this space. Um, we sit together and we hold judgment lightly we just absorb what each other is saying and, and learn from that on this continual learning journey that we are on as mentors. That's the other thing we're really excited about here. So that's there for you to think of. If you'd like to know more about him, I've got his website there and I will try, I will get this presentation out to you all after today as well. So you can have that too. We will talk about lots of different things potentially today. And if you would like to keep some of that secret after the event, um, please let me know because this is recorded. So um, I'll make sure that we can um, cut that out so that people, we won't be sharing that on. So that's not a problem. All right, well, we might kick off and get to the crux of the matter today. With, with what we're talking about is reflective practice. So here is a definition. So Donald Trump is quite well known in the art of reflective practice. Uh, at the end of this presentation, I have a link to one of his core books that you can download the free PDF of the whole book if you'd like to learn more specifically about this practice. Um, so here's a definition for you. You can read that. I'll leave you to read. Um, what do you think of this? I like this, it's simple, um, but we might get to here. And keep chatting away. I can see that some of you have already got um, Gills, Melbourne, she's identified the land she meets from, and Alex has as well. We're Adri country, so thanks, Alex. So my question here is to get the ball rolling, get us talking to each other, because I want to not talk very much today. I talked too much in the last one, I realised. So I want you guys to talk today because you're all mentors, you know this stuff. So um, what do you think? I want your personal opinion about what do you think of reflective practice? On the topics of do you like it? 
or not? Do you do it or not? And what's its value to you? What does it mean to you? So if there is a courageous presence here in this Zoom room today who would feel that they would talk about it, do you want to put your hand up and just unmute yourself, jump on in, talk away. Go, Steph. Yeah, I think reflective practice is really important because if um, you don't do it, I feel like, you know, we can, we're, we're all human, we'll make mistakes, but if you don't have the opportunity to learn from those mistakes, then we just get stuck in this loop, in this cycle where we uh, don't progress, you know, physically, emotionally, psychologically, what have you. Um, having said that, I do think you can also reflect too much, which um, I don't, I also believe is uh, probably not a healthy thing um, and get stuck in like negative headspace. But I think um, if you have a structure, to use reflective practice properly, it can be a really, really I'm valuable really tool. Great. That's, that's really great. Thanks, Steph. I appreciate that. Anybody else want to talk about what they think about, you know, um, what's value? Like, what is it, if, you know, in doing your reflective practice, what has it changed in you? How has it evolved you? So it's value to you. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's, it's really acknowledging, I think what I really like about reflective practices is making me realize the things that's gone well. Um, half the time when I was a really new into doing reflective practice, um, I realized that I'm reflecting on the things that I've done wrong rather than the things that I've done right. And um, I think one of the counselors said to me, well, you're beating yourself down rather than <laughs> improving yourself by thinking of the things that's gone wrong rather than gone right. Yeah. Point. And we're going to talk about more of the when do we reflect? Do we reflect on the positive or the negative? Like when do we do that? And we're going to have a look at that in a couple of slides. So thanks for bringing that up early, John. But reflective practice has been around for a while actually, and it was developed in disciplines such as teaching and medicine and those active roles where we work with people. And then we look at those experiences and we reflect back to go. What happened? What were those encounters like? Could have we done something differently there, something that would have been the same or had a different outcome? And the key thing about reflection that's really important, and um, it's not a one-size-fits-all gig, you know, um, how all, all of us in this session today would have a variance on how we reflect. And the great thing is we're all correct. Um, and this is a beautiful thing that I love about reflection. There is no right or wrong pathway to it. It is, it does what it does. Um, and, and it should be done to reflect whatever circumstance you've got going on at the moment. So that's a beautiful flexibility that I love. So that, which brings us to this concept of, you know, how do you do it? And I'm just going into the chat because, um, you know, Gil has said, basically, it can help you with your self-awareness. And that's another fabulous point about it, isn't it? It really does help you with, with that, um, that awareness. I'm going to go, oops, sorry, gone too far. So this is a little bit about how do you do it. And this is the thing that I was saying just a moment ago is so wonderful because it is flexible. So, um, you know, when we sing a song, instance I think about you know some some of those um, country and western musicians and they write a story and then they put music to it and then they sing it but sometimes in that story you can hear their heartache or their you know them coming out to a new realization so that's really a reflection isn't it and then you've got poets and then you've got um, people who do a debrief so they might have had an event happen at work and they do a debrief post event that's a reflection as well. Um, interpretive dance. Does anybody participate in interpretive dance? I've always found that fascinating. Um, I'm not a dancer myself. I hope this, maybe I'm a little envious. I don't know. Um, but whatever you do, I think the big point that we have to be mindful of as mentors, and you know, when we're we're trying to excite our with people who are our mentees, 
We're trying to um, inspire them to want to join this gang of reflective practitioners, right? So how can we do that with a bit of fun, you know? And and I guess a big key point is, is, you know, a lot of people when I do workshops will say to me, oh, Sue, I reflect in the car on the way home from work. That's how I do it. But sometimes that's um, just rumination. So we're just ruminating in our head and just thinking about our perception of what we saw happen and, oh, yeah, no, that was it. That's what I saw. And then by the time we get to the end of the journey, we stop. But often we haven't maybe thought about other people's point of view. We haven't looked at a learning that we could take from that. We might have just dwelled in it and then gone, yeah, no, we're right, they're wrong. All right, leave it at that. Um, so that's where um, ruminating can leave us in a negative cycle. And so that's where John just highlighted it before saying when he was doing it, he felt that he was just negative cycling. And so that can take away a lot of your own power. And so that's when reflective practice isn't working right for you. So then you have to, you know, come up with another way. So I guess now my question would be, how could you come up with another way of um, doing reflective practice? What, what's another way? So just say I do it one way, but it's not working for me and I'm finding myself sitting in that dwelling negative cycle, you know, how would I find out other ways? You can just put it in the chat if you like, you don't have to tell me. Oh, we've had a chat. Yeah, exactly. Ask what others do. Setting aside time to constructively think about how to improve. Oh, definitely. So, you know, ask others what they're doing for sure is another way of seeing another way of doing things always. I mean, we do it every day in our work lives, don't we? You know, we'll be working alongside someone and we'll see them do something a bit differently and we'll go, oh, I think I like that. I might adopt it. Pretty good jobs we have like that. And then with Gil saying, yeah, we really need to set aside time to constructively break things down. Um, clinical supervision sessions, really good example of that, Gil. Thank you for raising that. That's really important. Thank you. Because that brings us to, you know, we know these things and then brings us to this point of the benefits. So what are the benefits? If we know how to do it, we think it's great because as mentors, we're doing it a lot and we're really focused on it. So what are the benefits? So here's some benefits that, you know, the literature um, talks about and I've just, you know, got this from the literature. But what's a benefit to you personally? So for me... Personally, um, my benefit that I get from reflective practice is that it, it really helps me with that issue of self-talk in my head. So where I go, oh, I should have done that and I should have done this, and I get the shoulds. Has anybody had an episode of the shoulds sometimes in their self-talk? You know, that shoulda, woulda, coulda? Yeah. It's, it's a it, it, that's in that sort of that's working in that negative cycle space so that's where yes that's where it works for me but for everybody else what have we got going on the chats um, oh here we go alex oh alex we'll go back a step because alex used to say that um oh it works in a small team and we do a lot of outreach Oh, we do a lot of reflecting in the car. Is that because, Alex, there's a couple of you in the car? So you're almost doing a debrief then, aren't you, as you're sort of working? So that is a wonderful opportunity. I, I think that's a fabulous opportunity. I did the same in the um, when I was doing my placement as a student. Yeah. So after we do carpool and go to Maccas and get some soft serve and then debrief all the way through. <laughs> That, like I am loving that I'm hearing that, John. Like, because isn't it warm? That's such a warming thing to hear that 
you know, we've got beautiful parts of our profession that like, yeah, we can stop and get a soft serve cone and have a sit for a moment and just think about everything that we've seen and experienced. And we can talk about it. And isn't that wonderful that we have these mentors and these experienced people around us who we can embrace and do that with? Oh, I love it. Thank you. I love it. Um, Alex is, yes, at least two in the car. So that's a wonderful, you're almost like a group therapy session in your cars. That'd be lovely to almost drive back with you guys and just hear how you break things down. That's that's a great thing. And John was just saying in his chat, I recently applied for a job and writing my cover letter and addressing the selection criteria made me reflect on the accomplishments I had made in the last few years and months. Isn't that amazing? So here you are, you're doing an application for a job and it's a moment of reflection. See, it, and isn't it great you notice that? You, you are intuitively um, aware of yourself, John, that you can say, ah, oh, wow, I just saw that. That's great. And, and with you guys as mentors, this is what you know reflective practice to be beneficial. You know that it increases your emotional intelligence. Your emotional intelligence as mentors is much higher, you know, than people generally on the floor. Okay, who might be starting out in this business. So I guess the great thing about you as mentors is that, you know, how are you sharing this greatness that is reflective practice and this ability to grow yourself as you have? How are you sharing that with others? Because honestly, if reflective practice is this brilliant and this great and allows us to become bigger and better versions of ourselves, then why isn't everybody doing it? I'm a bit puzzled as to why everybody's just not jumping in and doing it. And so this is just something we, I wanted to highlight is that I personally, I'm very passionate about reflective practice as Steph can attest. She has sat with me for many a year um, and heard me go on about it. Um, so, but there's many barriers when I'm trying to inspire others, you know, novices into this world of reflective practice, I get some barriers. I'm wondering if you as mentors have experienced those barriers and could you share them with us today? What, what barriers have people told you about why they don't reflect? I guess if you're doing it right, sometimes it can be a little bit painful because you're kind of critiquing your own behaviours or actions and that, that can be quite confronting. So um, I guess that might be a, a barrier. I guess that is that, that self-awareness piece, isn't it, Steph? It's that, um, do I feel safe in myself? Um, and it, that's that unsafe act part there. Is it an unsafe act? Am I not ready for this today or am I not ready for it this week? Um, and that's okay too because you can actually put off reflection until you're a bit hardier. Um, you know, I always talk to people about the reflections that have happened over, um, you know, five years, you know, when you reflected on it the first time but then you'll come back to it some years later and you'll reflect on it again and you'll see a different outcome. So they're the chronological reflections that you can do. Um, and so the more and more you develop yourself as a reflective practitioner, the more you change. So you can go back and see outcomes. You know, I've got one reflection, which I always share with people, um, that happened to me um, 25 years ago when I first started, oh, 30 years ago now, when I first started in nursing. And, you know, it was a really significant event. And my reflections at five intervals on that event now very they it's almost like I'm a different person reflecting every time so that's a really interesting thing to watch your evolution and see how you're you know in the regards to you know um, Keegan's adult developmental theory I'm not sure if many of you are across this one but Robert Keegan is a, um, a he he wrote adult development theory which is you know um, a a movement onwards, I guess, from Piaget's um, children's sort of development theory. And it's really interesting when you look at that, and I promise that after today I'll send you the link so you can maybe learn more about it. But 
it's really interesting to watch how as adults we start evolving and we um, become self-authored and those sorts of things. So through reflective practice, when you look back at some of your reflections, you can see your evolution uh, and that's what we can do. Um, but back to the topic, which was how, what other barriers do you think some novices would have that we could be prepared for so that we can still inspire them? We can still go, look, you know, what if someone said to you, I got no time for this. I don't have time to sit down and reflect. This is rubbish, you know. What would you say to that person who said they had no time? What would you do? I guess if you get stuck in the same loop, then you're really wasting time if you're not learning lessons. So, you know, <laughs> make the time to learn the lesson. <laughs> you've got to make time. You've got to take time to make time, they say. So sometimes you've got to take a little bit of time to make a whole lot more. Okay, so that's a really important lesson to learn. What are some other barriers? Okay, so the main barriers that the literature sort of does talk about is that there's no time. Okay, which we've covered off. Um, organisational culture doesn't like us to sometimes reflect. So because if we're looking backwards at the way things are happening, then that's a risk for the, for the organisation. Um, some people just don't have, they just say, I can't do it. I don't know how to do it. Yeah. I love them because I, take, I want to embrace them and take them on a massive journey about how we can we can show you the way. Um, making time to the lack of time. <laughs> Sorry, I was just looking at Decima has just put in, helps remind you why you chose to do what you do and refocus at times. Yeah, that's true for reflective practice, totally. Acknowledging that something is, yeah. And it takes courage. That is right. It takes time and courage. And that's a big thing. Um, the environment, sometimes we don't have, we don't know where to do it. So we have to create the environment to do it in. We have to get, we have to change ourselves a little bit, become motivated to do it, to see the power of it. So, you know, we have to create a habit. Um, so, you know, the, the thing about making a habit, though, is that the theory of you have to do it for 40 days. So, um, you know, some research says it only takes 21 days to make a habit. Other research says 40, so I don't know the exact amount of days it takes to um, make a habit, but neuroplasticity research, which I probably value a bit more, talks about it being 40 days to change a brain to develop a new way of being. So that's where I'll take you down. So if you can tempt someone to just start doing something every day for 40 days, they can um, develop that. And then, you know, going back to what John talked about before when he was saying, well, you know, is it positive or negative experiences that I reflect on and, and how does that work for me? And so the answer to that is the wonderful flexibility of reflection of you can do it all. So you can focus on the negative um, to help with your learning journey. And you can focus on the positive to help you with your learning journey. They're all equal. I guess it comes down to your mindset. Where do you want your mindset to be? Do you want to sit in the positive or do you want to sit in the negative? What's your choice? Okay, because remember, this is all your choice where you sit in those things. Um, so I think the positive experiences are really important because they uplift you and they motivate you to keep growing and learning. Um, it encourages you to notice your growth, which is vital. So we can, we can actually self-care for ourselves and be grateful to ourselves for our own motivation to keep moving ourselves forward and drive ourselves forward to become the best version of, of ourselves. So it's a little bit of self-coaching there. Does that make sense to people? Just I can see some nods going on there. I can see some nods. Okay. Really important to get that into you, in, in, that thought of, oh, so 
okay, I can do my measurements. I can say, if I do, you know, I really want to do this. And, and Gil's just put a thumbs up. Um, I really want to do this because I want to see where it will take me. Okay, because the negative experiences are often easy to learn from and you can unpack things and you can see, you know, and if you're sitting with enough courage to look inwardly, like what Alex was saying with the courage part, if you can sit with it well enough and go, oh, I see what happened there because that person might have thought I said it this way. Uh, I can see now why they might have responded that way. So it allows you to have the compassion to see another way of being. Compassion is a really important part of, um, you know, mentoring, isn't it? You know, as, and in this group, you're all converted to that mentoring experience. But it's that compassion. It's, I can see why the person did it that way or I can see why the person thought that, okay, because we've got compassion and understanding because we're willing to step back and see it from another point of view, okay? But, yeah, you have to make time to do that. So the important part which of focusing on the negative is not to focus on it too much. As John highlighted from his mentor who said to him, mm, you're creating this, this thing where all you're seeing is the negative and that's demotivating after a period of time. So, you know, you've got to maintain a balance. And I think this comes back to a little bit about what we talked last hub session, where how do we keep a balance? How do we keep ourselves as mentors balanced and in the best place we can be to be the person that we are to all the people we are, okay? So it comes back. So you're amazing people. You are mentoring every day in your workplace. You are leaders. You are working really hard every day. You're reflecting and you're still growing yourself while still growing other people. How are you keeping your balance so that you are your best version of self every day and presencing as the best version of self every day? What are you doing to care for yourself? Yes, I'm feeling I'm feeling better in terms of self care now. I think it's really helpful to have a mentor and and to rem, to get some reminder and to have people around you who's probably going through the same thing. Yes. Um, and and a couple of reflections on the previous discussion is, I've learned about the term the looking glass self, where you're focused into how others perceive you. So you're thinking of how others would see you, and in that way that kind of sort of added to the negative thought of what you're. But what people might be thinking about you when you're reflecting yeah. um, and things like that. So it's good to have that insight, but at the same time, obviously, if, if it's too much, it can have negative repercussions yeah. as well. Yeah. But thanks, John, because I actually had a mentor many years ago pull me up on my um, that looking glass behavior. And um, that mentor highlighted to me, it, it was really challenging me because I, um, I must have obviously gone to a few mentor conversations going and then I don't think this person likes me and then I don't think this person even likes what I say and they shut me down all the time and they do this this and this and and I was I think I was running the victim role a little bit when I was going to mentoring conversations and my mentor just sat there and went Sue do you know it's none of your business what other people think of you and I, I just sat there and I sat there for a couple of minutes. I didn't speak. I just was like, but I was reconciling it in my head. Of course, it's my business. It's, it's me they're thinking about, you know, and, and you know, and, oh, and, and I was sort of like so put off. And, and I sat there going, I don't know what to do now. But what I learned from that later on was, well, it is none of my business to know what other people think of me. And if I do want to know what someone thinks of me, I have to go and ask them. You know, it's I really have to get the courage up and go, oi, you know, have I offended you? Or have I done, you know, I have to clarify and I have to go in there with courage and ask the courageous conversation and be curious and, and wonder how it has if I'm work. Stop and look at the birds and trees, etc. I not totally rushing everywhere, being mum's taxi, not good work. It is nice to not rush, isn't it? And then I have got, 
Oh, Decima, thanks, Decima. I think we could all find ways to be kinder to ourselves. Ah, yes. Yes, being honest with ourselves and others, being open to share our own experience with those we mentor and letting them know we are all learning. Oh, it is so important for everyone to realise we're on this lifelong learning journey. And that's as mentors, that's our underlying principle as a mentor is we're on a lifelong learning journey. And for people to acknowledge that and say, oh, so you're still learning. Oh, I'm, I don't know that I'll ever stop, except when I get to end of life and I die, I guess. That'll be when I cut the cord from learning, but I'm not there yet. Um, and I think this allows others to stop and reflect what you're able to do to say for me. Yep, I totally agree, Jessica. Thank you for sharing. I, I really do believe that as well. And Alex says, we are good at getting coffee and finding a room to sit and chat. We work in a mosh pit, no privacy. Oh, I know that, yes. Um, especially after a complicated client case. Great, Alex. This is fabulous because you're caring for self by stopping, pausing, having a coffee. And then you're caring for others by sharing the experience and checking in. And, you know, ah, it's, uh, we need to let, you know, we need to, I don't know, I want to shout this from the rooftops to share this with everyone right now that we've got, you're all from different organisations and you're all talking about how you're caring for each other and caring for self. This is wonderful. Thank you very much. So, I might go to that next slide where, you, where it's this idea of if we're creating, if we're inspiring mentees, because that's where we're always going to as mentors, we're thinking about how can we inspire mentees to want to get on this bus? Because we want them on the bus and we want them to start growing themselves and, you know, replacing us effectively. <laughs> this is what I always think. I want to inspire people to do what I do so they can replace me and then I can move on. You know, that's my dream, you know, is always to do that. So how can we get people on board with this new habit? And it's talking about um, this idea of reflecting every day. So, and not hard reflections. I'm not saying we have to um, follow um, models. So I think what happened a lot for people many years ago when they started learning about reflective practice it was done um, as a, you know, an assessment item. And the person who asked you to do it as an assessment item wasn't really inspired by reflective practice. So they taught it in a very robotic way saying, oh, look, here's, you know, um, a couple of models. Pick the model that works for you and start filling out this template. And um, make sure you answer all the questions and then get a learning at the end and then you're all set. And that's reflective practice. And so I think for some of it, and certainly with my experience um, in my early days in my nursing story, was that was how reflective practice was taught to me, was very much by this person who, who really wasn't inspired by it, just was trying to get me to do it um, because it was an assessment item. And so I didn't value it until I probably had something really significant happen to me where I had this beautiful mentor who took me through their version, which was not, you know, um, Gibbs or Driscoll's or, you know, Cobb's. And, you know, have you are you familiar with Cobb's experiential learning reflective cycle? And then there's Gibbs reflective cycle and the, the, the classics that we're very familiar with. Um, then there's the era one, which is just experience, reflection and your action. So it's very, you know, cut and dried, that one. Um, so I challenge this because I don't, I think reflective practice doesn't have to be formal. I mean, you can use formal templates. And I know in Pepper, when we do the workshop, um, I extend you as, um, I'm just going to stop sharing this for a minute because I want to switch my share. It's a formal, you know, ask lots of questions, give lots of answers, and it's based on a, it's based on a cold cycle. Um, and I get you to use that one, but that's because you're experienced mentors and I want you to think more deeply and I want to challenge yourself to think a little bit more. So if I had a mentee who was a beautiful little novice and I was trying to inspire them to become the next version of them, 
I would probably go a bit lighter with them. I'd probably be a bit more, hey, you know, let's just do something simple every day. Let's get to the end of the day and write maybe just a simple gratitude journal. At the end of the day, what's three things that you're grateful for from today? You know, it might be that you were a lovely mentor and you were so kind to me. It might be um, I really enjoyed meeting the patients. It might be, you know, as Alex talked about, you know, I have worked with a great team and I really like the debrief and the ice cream in the car <laughs> where we got to sit and talk about how the day went. And so in part, that is really vital reflection from that, that mentee because now they've learned three new ways of being. So effectively, when they, in the future, they start being a mentor, they'll think back to the debrief in the car with the ice cream or the, you know, my mentor was always so kind and patient with me. So as a mentor, I will be kind and I will be patient. But, you know, it, it takes time to learn how to be that kind and that patient. As you all know, you weren't born kind and patient. You've evolved to that place. So, um, so that's really important. So that's a version. That so to, to stimulate someone to have a simple reflection, I think the first place to go really well with is just a simple emotional guidance scale. I don't know if... So this emotional guidance scale is something that's um, created by a couple of psychologists who work in the art of um, the law of attraction. Um, and... Basically, they what they try to get people to do is at the end of a day or the end of a shift or wherever you want to place yourself to do this, just look at and just be quiet with yourself for a moment and check in and go, if today was, you know, I know uh, the day I had today, did I sit in positive emotion or negative emotion today as listed by this document. So you can see here there's positives and negatives there and, you know, um, and, and, you know, what did I sit in? And so if I said to myself, you know, well, I think looking at that, um, I sat in probably maybe 50% in negative 50% in positive, you know, and why was that? Why, why was I bored today? Why was I getting impatient? Why was I irritated? So these are some things I might have remembered about my day, okay? So why? Why was I there? And then check in. Why? Why was I there? And it might be something simple. It goes up for you so you can see them more clearly. Um, so if I was there, then why? Is it because I was tired? I didn't sleep well last night. Is it because simply I could be hormonal? Is it simply because I've just lost a loved one? Is it just simply, you know, it could be something that you can really identify. Then if it is those things that you can easily identify, then what can you change in you so that you can maybe self-care? So go back to what we were talking about. Do I need a day off to refresh and pull my, you know, and get myself back to my values? My values are really strong and um, I really value um, that I'm a positive person. I really value that I come from a place of peace and joy most of the time. And I like to just sit quietly and let things be and be in a quiet moment often these days. Um, and that's where I like to be. So if I'm varying out of that, then why? And that's where I'll pull myself back and I'll have a look. It could be that I need a day off. It could be that I, you know, I might be struggling with getting a particular task done at work because it is a bit beyond me. Oh, that's even good to acknowledge because if there's something at work that is beyond me, what can I do to get it back? within my control so it could be i lean on someone for some help oh what a wonderful thing do you know we're not islands we're surrounded by amazing people in workplaces 
because there's a bunch of people around us who, you know, have got some amazing skills. So I might need to lean on someone for a bit of support. So the, the thing of it all is, is that we're trying to shift from that negative emotion mindset up into this positive space that aligns with our values. Okay. So this is something that I've just taken 10 hours to explain to you, but it doesn't have to be this hard, does it? Okay. I think you as experienced people would probably be quite quick on this one, even though it is new to you. Has anybody ever seen this before? Um, Want to share with people and, you know, it's you can share it away. It's all referenced and ready to go. Um, can I just hear from anyone if they think it's something they might give a go? I think. I think this is something that would be probably be good in an app version, actually. It's almost like a self-check-in. <laughs> like, how's your day today? And and then you kind of tick it and then it's kind of give you evaluation. I, I just thought about it because people are kind of using their phones a lot. And, yes. yeah. I love that, job. Actually, that is, I don't know, Steph, should we create the Mentoring Hub app on this one? We could, I'm sure we could put together a little app and put this off to the side, John. Thank you for that excellent idea. Any questions? Does anybody have anything that they would like to know more about or links to things that might be beneficial to them? Because this is why, you know, I'm here, Steph's here. We're Pepper people. We like to create things. So if you would like, if you would think that, you know, in that um, mentoring hub toolkit that we have on the website, if you want us to add things to it, we're certainly willing to, you know, make that your toolkit at the end of the day that has everything you need to inspire your mentees to have a go at trying some different things, you know, to grow themselves. That's what we're here for. Yes, Ma, I think the scale helps put outside influence and work-related issues together. Oh, that's the outside influence. True. True, true. That's a really good point, this Ma, because... Yeah, you know, how it's how we're reacting to our environment, isn't it? You know, how do we feel about, you know, how are we allowing our environments to affect us and, and hold us in a negative place too? We're giving permission, you know, and so we're, we're actually reflecting on those emotions to say, hey, I'm going to block that and I'm, I, can, I can do this differently. I don't have to sit in the negative with this. I can think on this differently and I can move myself up into the positive, and I'm not going to react to it this way. So no, good point, just I thank you. Um, that well. reflection and that thinking mindset. So it's watch your thoughts. So when I'm thinking something negative, the words that come out of my mouth will probably be negative and follow. Those words coming out of my mouth that are negative might turn into negative actions. If my negative actions happen too much and nearly every day, then does that become my habit of being negative? Then if I'm negative in my habits a lot, does it become my character? And then my character might become my destiny. <laughs> this frightens me <laughs> when I read it. <laughs> so I switched my brain up and I went, so if I'm, my thoughts are positive, my words are positive. If my words are positive, my actions are positive. If my actions are positive, my habits are positive. If my habits remain positive, my character remains positive. If my character is positive, my destiny is very positive. And then I got so excited. You know, I don't know. And I, I, I get, I generally get too excited about this stuff as a rule. Um, what do you think of this? I think I need this tattooed on my arm or something. <laughs> I can see it constantly. Yeah, I think everyone needs it by their computer exactly. or something to remind you. Yeah. So to remind you every day, your positive thoughts become positive words. Your positive words become positive actions. Your positive actions become positive habits. Your positive habits are positive character. Your positive character is a positive future for you. And you know what? People around you will notice and people will go, wow, you know, why are you always this cheery, um, you know, positive person? Not to say you still won't have negative downtime and we'll always have negative self-talk. We're human. We've got 
left and right sides of brains in action at the same time. That's the beauty of us. But wouldn't it be more, you know, wouldn't we be, you know, maybe more aligning with our values and who we want to be as people if we were in that positive place? That's what I want to leave you with today. We've reached the end of our session. Thank you so much for attending. I am so grateful to you when you come along and share this time. So thank you everyone for coming. And um, I'll put this up on the website so we can watch it back. Um, I'll edit it, of course, because sometimes I waffle over words. So I get rid of that stuff. Um, and next month, um, this topic is about mindsetting and it's about positive mindsets so i hope you can join us next month i'm going to try and shift the hour down to four to five um, only because i'm getting feedback that people have more time later in the day and that we would probably attract more people to the session if we go a bit later so bear with me while i'm trying to find the best way to appeal to the to a bigger audience and we'll get there together i think Thank you for being mentors. Thank you for being you. Thank you for being here. And I hope to speak to you really soon. Can I say goodbye now? Thank you. Thanks, Sue. No Thank worries. you. You're very welcome, John. Welcome, Desimo. Thank you, Alex. See you, bye.